Just as we have songs of freedom to inspire us, we also possess stories of freedom. This morning, I want to inspire, motivate, and energize you with stories that you might be uplifted in those moments of quiet despair when you are troubled and wavering, and just a reminder that it's gonna be all right. Early in my life, I discovered the power of stories and how the lives of others could lift my spirits. So I have compiled stories about Unitarian Universalist Chicago women. And so I begin with legends. Legends are those that have died and become ancestors that guide us in our prayers, our dreams, meditations, and when we are open to hearing them, they might even speak to us. Speak her name. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. I lift her name as someone that is very special to me, but she is not a Chicago girl, so she doesn't get to be included in the mix. No, I start instead with Fanny Barrier Williams. Born in 1855, she traveled widely and eventually moved south to take a teaching position. She was shocked at the awful conditions and mistreatment she experienced merely because she was Black. Williams joined All Souls Unitarian Church in Chicago, where she met Celia Parker Woolley, who later became a Unitarian minister. Williams helped found the Provident Hospital and Training School of Nurses, and in 1905, she and the Reverend Celia Parker Woolley founded the Frederick Douglass Center. Some of Williams' accomplishments include her work with Jane Addams at Hull House, her induction as the first black woman admitted to the Chicago Women's Club in 1896, her service on the NAACP and also as the first black and first woman on the Chicago Library Board. Williams was also an accomplished lecturer and spoke at the Chicago Columbian Exposition of 1893. She was close friends with Susan B. Anthony and was one of several women to eulogize Anthony upon her death. Speak her name, Marcella Walker McGee. McGee and her husband, Reverend Louis McGee, and a friend formed an interracial group in South Chicago named the Free Religious Fellowship in 1948. She created a choir, study groups, and a women's group. In 1960, she was elected to the Continental Board of the Joint Alliance of the Unitarian Women and the Association of Universalist Women. And in 1961, the year of our consolidation between Unitarians and Universalists, she was instrumental in bringing the two women's groups together for consolidation. And in the next year, 1962, the two groups merged and became the Unitarian Universalist Women's Federation. She received the Clara Barton Sisterhood Award for women over 80 years old for her commitment and significant contributions to UU women's groups in 1994. That was the same period that I became a Unitarian Universalist. And I also joined the UU Women's Federation I never heard her name mentioned in that context. We missed knowing each other by a mere two years. I regret not having the opportunity to meet this woman. Speak her name, Pauline McCoo. Pauline Daly McCoo came to First Unitarian Church on October 19th, 1947. She was 18 years old. She had just started teacher's college. Many of you knew her and there is little I can tell you that you don't already know. However, going through my files, I found a handwritten copy 
of the speech she gave dated May 20th, 2007. It reads, today is May 20th, 2007. Today I was thrilled to be honored for the 60 years I have been fortunate enough to be a contributing member of this society. At the Strawberry Shortcake Social, I was pleased to tell the story of what happened back in 1947 to new members who had not heard it before. She mentions how when she came home, a Meadville student family invited her to dinner. And as she said, they served me wine like a real adult. Then they invited me to teach at the Sunday school. To be allowed to teach real children with only one year of teacher's college was awesome. The parent group were enthusiastic and supportive. So when they asked me to sign the spring membership book, I was willing to do so. On the Sunday I was to be presented, I invited my parents to attend. It therefore came as a shock that after the morning service, the chairman of the board approached my parents and commented that, quote, we don't mind if they, Negroes, were like your daughter, unquote. My years as a member of this society have been rewarding, supportive, and have defined my ability to be a positive force in making our community strong, unquote. The one picture I have taken of Polly McCoo, she was not wearing lipstick that day. She was seated at a table in Hall Chapel. Her vanity got the best of her and she asked me to take another picture later when she had benefit of makeup. To avoid the temptation of using the picture, which I thought looked fine, I deleted it. Polly died on October 10th, 2007, before we were able to take another picture. She is sorely missed here in the congregation. And I am grateful that I was able to hear her story and to get to know her. Speak her name. Fern Gaydon. Fern Gaydon was born in 1905 in Dunlap, Kansas. She attended college in Emporia, Kansas and came to Chicago in 1927. Fern was quite a woman. She was an activist and a writer as well as a Chicago social worker for 50 years. She served as a president of the Southside Community Arts Center and was a patron of the arts. She was the founder of Negro Story Magazine and a lifelong activist on behalf of world peace. As a member of the Southside Writers Group in Chicago, she was among such luminaries as Gwendolyn Brooks, Margaret Walker, and Richard Wright. Both of her grandparents, Columbus, and Josephine Johnson had been slaves and had become associated with the Freedmen's Bureau in Tennessee in the 1880s. Resentment by whites against their work forced them to join the great migration up north to Kansas. And from there, the story is familiar. They moved on to Chicago. Gaydon worked on the Chicago Urban League's membership campaign and, and was at the forefront of a 1927 protest against segregated beaches. She was a member of First Unitarian Church of Chicago. Speak her name, Roberta Wilson, active with the Parent Teachers Association and the League of Women Voters in Chicago, Illinois. She became involved in the civil rights movement and participated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the Poor People's March on Washington in 1963. 
1967 and 68, she marched with Dr. King in Gage Park and Belmont Cragen. It was her interest and belief in the teachings of Dr. King that brought her to Third Unitarian Church. She was the first black person to become a member in 1968. Roberta Wilson became chair of the Third Church Scholarship Committee. She served on the board and worked with the Harriet Tubman Food Pantry, along with the South Austin Coalition and many other organizations. In 1974, she started the Third Unitarian Scholarship Fund, which provided monetary assistance to local students heading to college. She also organized and managed the annual coat drive and volunteered at local food pantries and shelters. She told me in a conversation that when Dr. King came to Chicago in 1966, none of the black churches wanted to host him. They were afraid of the potential violence. Third Unitarian hosted him. I came to hear Dr. King speak, she said. Then I was curious about these white folks that hosted him. They asked me to join and I told them, I don't know. I'll think about you white folks, she said. I was already radical, but I got worse when I came to Third Unitarian. She says, my sister said, boy, your mother failed you. You are heathen. She was quite a character. That was Roberta Wilson. Speak her name, Anita Young Boswell. When Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. led a massive civil rights demonstration in Chicago in the summer of 1966, Anita Young Boswell di directed the women's division of the march. Boswell, a social worker, a university professor, and titan in Chicago's social justice arena helped to found the national hookup of Black women and the League of Black Women. Boswell was the sister of the late Whitney Young Jr., himself a civil rights leader who was the executive director of the National Urban League. Boswell shared her brother's passion for social justice. During World War II, she joined the American Red Cross and served as a recreation director for soldiers in Germany. On her return, she became a social worker with the Red Cross and was trained to fly by a Tuskegee Airman at Fisk University in Tennessee. Mrs. Boswell taught social work for 19 years at the University of Chicago and was one of the founders of the Chicago Urban League and the Women's Board of the Chicago Urban League. Upon her death at 82, a memorial service was held at First Unitarian Church of Chicago, where she had been a member. If you are ever at 6644 South University Avenue, you will find the Arnita Young Boswell Park, a children's playground dedicated in her name. Speak her name, Margaret Burroughs, artist, historian, teacher, and writer. Born in 1917, she attended Inglewood High School along with poet, to be poet, Gwendolyn Brooks. As classmates, the two joined the NAACP Youth Council. She helped to establish the Southside Community Arts Center she earned a teacher certificate from Chicago Teachers College, a master's in fine arts and a bachelor from the Art Institute of Chicago. Burroughs taught at DeSavo High School from 1946 to 1969 and from 69 to 79, she was a professor of humanities at Kennedy King College. Dr. Burroughs was also a prolific writer and wrote for the Associated Negro Press. And she is also credited with the founding of Chicago's Lake Meadows Art Fair in the early 1950s. Burroughs and her husband Charles co-founded the DuSable Museum of African-American History in 1961. 
It was originally known as the Ebony Museum of Negro History and Art. The Institute began in their living room. Imagine that in their living room where they were residents in the Bronzeville community. Margaret Burrell served as its executive director for the first 10 years. The museum eventually moved to its current location and today is the oldest museum of black culture in the entire United States. Her works have been sh shown all over the world, including Germany, Mexico, Poland, and the Soviet Union. She has also served as chair of the National Conference of Artists. She received numerous awards in her lifetime. Dr. Margaret Taylor Burroughs died on November 21st, 2011. Speak her name, Selena E. Reed, wife, mother, social worker and administrator, therapist and tireless community builder who left a powerful legacy of civic leadership and social activism. Where she found the time and stamina to serve on the many boards is a testament of her commitment and her visionary leadership. Her board affiliations included the Urban League, NAACP, PUSH, the Lincoln Center, and not included are the organizations she founded and co-founded. Among her greatest accomplishments, I believe, was the creation of the Chicago Center for the Society of Samaritans. As a suicide prevention leader and founder, she was committed to creating and maintaining a hotline for individuals that needed a listener in the midst of their depression and loneliness and suicidal thoughts and tendencies. Reed served as the executive director for Samaritans from 1981 to 1985. Her commitment to Unitarian Universalism was evidenced in her tenure as president of the board and convener of the Black Unitarian Universalist Caucus of Chicago. Reed and her family's attendance and participation in the life of First Unitarian Church provided her children a safe and stimulating environment. Her ability to invite individuals to be more than they were while giving others the courage and nerve to explore new possibilities is perhaps acknowledged in the overwhelming presence of the 500 individuals that came to say their final goodbyes to a woman whose life was exemplified by her vision of a just and compassionate world and whose actions demonstrated her belief that our actions are capable of changing the world. We move now to the living legends. We speak her name, Brenetta Howe Barrett. Barrett was born June 28, 1932 on the south side of Chicago. She had multiple careers that included journalism, social welfare, and politics. In 1961, she began working for the Chicago Urban League as the field secretary for voter registration. She organized the West Side Parents Council for Integrated Schools. This protest group participated in the citywide movement to fight overcrowding that was created by segregationist policies. Barrett worked with key figures, including Bennett Johnson, Timuel Black, Jesse Jackson and other founders of the Chicago Freedom Movement, a civil rights coalition of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Coordinating Council of Community Organizations. She also worked with CORE, the Congress of um, Racial Equality. When Dr. King came to Chicago in 1966, Barrett was among the leaders who worked with him and his staff on major issues. She was awarded the Women's Fighter for Freedom Award in 2013, and I was fortunate to meet her when I was working with Third Unitarian Church. 
speak her name, Dr. Norma Poinsett. Dr. Norma Poinsett and I got together every Sunday after church for several weeks. She would make dinner and over her home-cooked Southern cuisine, we would talk and I would scribble and write the words she spoke between our mouthfuls of food. I would then go home and transcribe my notes and send them to her and she would edit them. For someone that had been suffering from writer's block, she was amazingly prolific. So the process worked wonderfully for both of us. I had just moved to Chicago, essentially with no relatives, and she was my play mama, feeding me and taking care of me. I was her play daughter, basking in her light, listening to her stories, and realizing how much it mirrored my own Southern Black roots. Here are some of Norma's reflections. She said, when I was five years old, my sheltered world changed as I began to become aware of the racial realities of blacks and whites in the South. My sisters and brothers went to a school a mile and a half away. Via our shortcut and two miles as the crow flies along the main road. We passed the white school, Lebanon Elementary School every day to get to our black school, Burley Hamilton Elementary School. The white children would taunt us and yell, hey niggers, when they passed us on the bus. They threw rocks or paper wads at us. Sometimes they spat at us. We often retorted. At times the bus driver intentionally veered the bus near the edge of the gravel road and forced us to hop into the ditch. Another incident concerned Alice Brock. We had a beautiful flower garden with rows and rows of annuals, she writes. People would come and ask for a bouquet of flowers. One day, Alice Brock, a young white girl about nine, skipped about admiring the flowers and letting me know which one she wanted cut. She said, Norma, my birthday is coming up and um, I'm letting you know that you're gonna to have to call me Miss Alice when that happens. I retorted without a second thought. The day I call you Miss Alice, you will have to call me Miss Norma. I don't recall her response. I think she was shocked. She simply took her flowers and went home. Fortunately, I had a strong sense of self and knew I was somebody. These are the words of just some of our Black Unitarian Universalist Chicago women. Final reflections from an interview that I conducted. My question, what attracted you to Unitarian Universalism? And she said very simply, it's openness to, to exploring the world's many different theologies. I came from the Methodist tradition, which does not welcome questions about anything. What has kept you Unitarian Universalist, I ask, continuing the search for understanding about humankind's need for religion. My next question, what has it been like to be a black female in a predominantly white faith tradition? She said, I have spent so much time in the church that I am indifferent to any little slights I may have encountered. My search for truth and meaning is my personal journey and others do not affect my trajectory. I can share my experiences, but I do not depend on anyone to validate my understanding. And then the final question was, what have been some of the greatest obstacles and barriers? She said, because many of the white people in this congregation have advanced degrees, there is a tendency for them to dismiss the actual lived experiences of those who don't live up to their high standards. That's why our welcome in the service states, if you have a PhD or a GED or no degree, you are welcome here. We have to state it every Sunday precisely because people are being judged based on their credentials. <laughs>